Okay, so um, the Brookings Institute in D.C. Uh, conducted a very extensive poll, uh, very extensive research, actually. A poll wouldn't even be a good way to put it. This was a very, very in-depth uh, uh, project they worked on. And they were talking about the uh, religion and politics and everything. They, they, they got into some specific religions, uh, particularly uh, Catholicism. And here's what they discovered. Um, this is from a poll they just really, or the survey they just released yesterday. There are more what are called social justice Catholics than there are right to life Catholics. And social justice, 60% of Catholics they uh, included in the survey, 60% of them uh, counted themselves as social justice Catholics compared to about 30%. Twice as many Catholics who self-identified as Catholics said they were more concerned about social justice issues like poverty than they were about questions such as abortion or contraception or you know, euthanasia. Now, another point they brought out in this poll is that social justice Catholics are more likely than right-to-life Catholics to favor Obama, 60 to 37%. So you know, out of every you know, roughly 100 Three or uh, out of every uh, five, three will favor Obama. Two right to lifers will uh, uh, will vote for uh, uh, Romney, uh, and the right to life Catholics just essentially just flipped around. Right to life Catholics support the right the more right to life candidate in the uh, in the election, which is Romney. And I say more in quotes, uh, and the more social justice Catholics um, support Obama, and that was true. Uh, you can take it to the bank. That was true back in uh, uh, back in the 2008, as we saw 54% of Catholics, self-identified Catholics, voted for uh, Obama. So um, a fellow named Dan Shea, uh, who uh, follows us and is a viewer, sent us a paper, a, an article that he had written, and he had some really wonderful quotes in it. And we'd like to kind of keep referring back to that because the topic in tonight's show is really what have lukewarm Catholics done uh, what have they caused to happen to the culture? He wrapped up his paper with this, uh, or his article, with this particular paragraph I'd like to quote and say, thank you, Dan, if you're listening, thank you for this. He says, quote, In this licentious age, the void between a Catholic's personal faith and his lack of public input may just border on hypocrisy. The common good demands individuals sacrifice their level of comfort for the good of the nation. I'll go back and repeat that. The common good demands individuals sacrifice their level of comfort for the good of the nation. Hence, not only is the culture in peril, but also in different souls. Thank you very much, Dan. That is a, uh, uh, actually is a very big, uh, uh, is, it's a very big topic. You know, a lot of people are sort of so focused, Catholics are so focused in on this election, we forget and the end of the day, it's not about who wins the White House. It's not about this piece of legislation or that piece of legislation. Uh, it, is, uh, uh, it really is who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. That's the real, uh, the real issue here. We'd like to remind you also that you can join our chat room. It was exceedingly busy last week's show. Uh, and our big topic is, has America ever truly welcomed the Catholic Church? Has that ever happened? Has America ever really welcomed the Catholic Church? Uh, we'd like to play a... Uh, uh, sound recording for you. Now, we're going to go back. Now, many of you may know Archbishop Sheen, Fulton Sheen, from you know his different writings and all that and his TV show, but something a lot of people seem to forget, Archbishop Sheen was a truly dedicated American patriot. He was dedicated to not necessarily just the concepts that America was founded on, but you know, the, the better angels, as Abraham Lincoln would say. He was really dedicated to that. I served Mass for Bishop Sheen on the bicentennial, July 4th, 1976, in San Francisco. He was the guest homilist, and what a tremendous... I still remember the uh, bits and pieces of the, of the homily he gave that day. It was tremendous. He is, was, still is, uh, very, very concerned about the soul of the nation, and he saw way back when the danger of how the political and social order could become the fixation as people started to sort of drift away and turn their backs on God, lose interest in religion, in the spiritual, and start to focus on the temporal. We'd like to play, we're going to play a number of his quotes dealing with this throughout the show, so we'd like to play this first one. But in any case, it was the third temptation of our blessed Lord not to be concerned with the divine, but to be concerned only with the social and political order. Now, he's talking about, uh, obviously, the uh, third temptation of our blessed Lord out in the desert from uh, Satan, 
uh, who says, you know, bow down and I'll, you know, bow down and worship me. I'll give you all these kingdoms. He was, uh, 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 that was a theme that Bishop Sheen harped on quite a bit, the responsibility, what goes on in the, uh, you know, what goes on in the social order, you know, that we start to replace so much of our concern on the spiritual. And this is what's happened in the social justice uh, movement that has sort of grabbed hold of the church and started this stranglehold uh, on the church. And uh, that there's all this emphasis on trying to achieve some sort of you know, utopia here on earth through legislation and control of a political party and control of an agenda. And that's not at the end of the day, my fellow Catholics, what we're in this world for. We are in this world to, number one, save our souls by cooperating with grace and the sacraments, etc. Number two, in order to spread the gospel to other people to also enhance their chance at salvation. At the end of the day, that's what we're here for. Yes, sometimes these things are better achieved if the culture is not as coarse and horrible and favoring murder and all that, but we have that mission to do regardless of what the culture is. And a lot, I think a lot of Catholics kind of seem to lose, lose touch with this. All right, uh, this poll, that, uh, the survey that was done by the Brookings Institute, um, measured how many people in the, uh, in the country are religiously affiliated versus, uh, versus religiously unaffiliated, meaning they don't have any kind of connection to religion at all, if, you know, if anything from atheist up to maybe just grandma says God every now and then. That's about it. Interesting, what they discovered was that more children today, this is one of their sum-ups, more children today are growing up in homes in the United States that have no religious affiliation, more children than not. Can you imagine that? There's no training, no information at all. This is becoming a pagan nation. Now, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be very... Uh, it shouldn't be very surprising. I mean, there's a number of Western nations already. You want to see a pagan nation, as Father Benedict Rochelle said once, you want to see a pagan nation, <laughs> go to the United Kingdom. It is a massively pagan. Uh, there are more, it's interesting that the Church of England, obviously, is the official state religion in England, in, in, the, United, in the United Kingdom. More Catholics who, by the way, it was illegal for a good, long, good, good amount of time to be a Catholic in England, more Catholics go to Mass on Sunday in England than members of the Church of England, the official state religion, attend their services. That's, that's just, that shows you the state of affairs in England. Um, now, among the irreligious uh, American crowd, not surprising, the vast majority, three-quarters compared to a quarter, three-quarters of them support Obama. Ah, there's a, there's a newsflash. Stop the presses. Now, religious Americans, obviously, are more likely to vote for Obama. One of the things they did here in the, in the, the Brookings Institute did was sit down and figure out, um, they sit down and figure out, you know, is this irreligious American sort of one group, or is it sort of, you know, is it one homogeneous group, or is it made up of different things? Well, they sat down and they broke it apart, and here's how they broke it apart. They said it really is, the, the irreligious Americans group is sort of a composition of three groups roughly the same size. Uh, they called one, one portion the seculars, another one the atheists and agnostics, and the other one the unattached believers. Now, the atheists and the agnostics were the ones that were sort of more or most hostile to religion in general, uh, being atheists, that makes sense, and uh, they were the, in those subcategories, they were the group that was most supporting Obama. The next group, which is the largest of the three, not much more than atheists, is seculars, or people who are just kind of indifferent to religion. They're more concerned with money and career advancement and that sort of thing. And then there was another, the other group of the three, which was the smaller one that they, they tagged, the unattached believers, meaning they had some sort of passing, uh, you know, they understood maybe there was a God, but, you know, they didn't belong to a religion. They sort of typified themselves as, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. And you've, you've heard that line uh, quite often. Uh, the portion of them, I believe it was close to 20%, wasn't it? The irreligious were about 20%. I'm checking with our crack researcher, Phil, over here on the side. Uh, I believe it was about 20%. It was very close. And uh, that, the, that hefty a percentage of people in the, uh, uh, in the United States would be irreligious and then break down into those categories that's a little frightening. Uh, it's it, what that portends for the future, and a large number of them are young. 
so that's quite the uh, you know scary scary statistic uh, when you look at it. Now, what portion of the irreligious of those three groups are made up with of, of made up of former Catholics? Some of you may remember that there was a poll done by Gallup about two years ago that said 10%, 10% of Americans, one out of every 10 Americans walking around was a former Catholic. If that isn't disturbing enough, a for, identified themselves as a former Catholic, that's, that's frightening. Well, what's the number now? It's actually gotten worse two years later today, according to the Brookings Institute and their big massive survey project here. Now it's one out of every nine Catholics walking around, or nine out of nine, one out of every nine Americans walking around as a former Catholic, one out of nine. It's a, little, uh, it's a little disturbing because when they leave the church and they join this irreligious group, whatever category, subcategory they get into, seculars, atheists, unattached, kind of spiritual but not religious, this group votes for the most liberal candidates, the most liberal policies that, that exist. They're pro-abortion, pro-same-sex marriage, the whole bit. That group is expanding, and it's expanding with an injection of a good number of former Catholics, and it's growing in, in large. So this is the reason some of these elections are so close, because America is undergoing a massive, massive transformation of a country founded on uh, uh, you know, that lived, not founded necessarily, but lived these very, uh, uh, very uh, strict moral code, and it is abandoning that.